Hello everybody, uh, I'm John Farron, the ex-editor of BBC Time Watch and the uh, man who thought up Digging for Britain. And joining me is John Hayes Fisher, who produced the first episode in the first series many years ago. So John, I thought up Digging for Britain because I wanted to create a different place for archaeologists to be able to talk about archaeology with authenticity. And after some arguments with the channel, they decided to let us have a go for four films. We weren't at all sure it was going to work, what we were doing. We decided that we'd try and do it era by era. And you got episode one, The Romans. What happened next? Well, I got episode one, really, because one of the other producers, Serena, had a wedding on a day that this was meant to... Uh, or we were meant to be filming or something like that. And I just said, oh, I'll do the Romans. I can't remember which one I'd been assigned, whether it was Iron Age or whatever. But um, I said, I'll do the Romans. And I'm very pleased I did because there were a lot of really good stories with the Romans. They sure were. And I mean, how did it work when you started bringing up archaeologists and saying who, who we are and what we were doing? So we had a very good researcher who I shared with James Gray um, who was another of the producers, and Gemma came up with the initial kind of bunch of stories, and then she handed them to me, and I would go through them piece by piece and say, yes, I like this, no, I don't like that. But she came up with an extraordinary group of stories, and I really then left it to her to do the initial contact um, with the archaeologists, and she had Alice Roberts' name kind of attached to the series, and that was a big, big help. Yes, so Alice was a young presenter then, and we were kind of looking for a new face of history. I mean, what, what, why did we decide on Alice, I suppose? She had done episodes of Coast, and I think she'd been a bone expert on Time Team, done bit things, really. She was young, fresh-faced, and I believe she was recently a mother. Um, you probably know more about that in terms of kind of trying to you know, persuade her that it was still worthwhile her doing it. But actually, I look back on my programme, which, you know, was done 12 years ago, and I hadn't seen it for a decade. And I realised right there, she had this sparkle, which was picked up by all the news previewers, but, and saying, yes, we love Alice, Alice Roberts. So she knew her stuff, and she knew how to engage with the archaeologists. And I believe that they liked her. And we were very, very fortunate, or maybe it was her, that we had a particularly, we had a group of very, very eloquent contributors, archaeologists. And I think a lot of the reason they were so good is because they knew how to, in, uh, to engage with somebody who knew what they were talking about. Yeah, I think it, it comes down to trust, doesn't it? I think that people trusted Alice and to a certain extent they trusted the the name of the BBC and and the stuff that we'd done before but I think you you've put your finger on it when Alice starts talking to archaeologists they go deep into a world that we don't get let into usually and they're not worrying about let's try and not say the word dendrochronology because people might not understand it let's just let's just talk and I think that particularly works when Alice is confronted with bone. She loves a skeleton. One of the best stories we had was about finding these skeletons, 97 skeletons of Roman babies, which appear to have been uh, infanticide. And it was a fantastic detective story that we uncovered. But because she was a bone expert herself, she really engaged with it. And being a young mother herself, her daughter was only two months old, she was actually deeply moved by the fact that these were 40 week old infants who appeared to have been killed by the Romans for whatever. They, they actually thought that these were um, from a brothel and they were, um, they were the result of, I don't know whether you call them sex workers, prostitutes, whatever it was, but um, they had been put away by the archaeologist back in 1912 into cigar boxes very unceremonious and then that this wonderful archaeologist Jill Ayers from Chiltern Archaeology found them in this long-term um, <clears throat> kind of process 
and then handed them over to a bone expert, Simon Hayes, Simon, uh, uh, down at English, Mays, sorry, down at English Heritage. And he kind of worked out what had happened. So um, quite what, extraordinary. what do you feel like as a producer when a story like that lands in your lap? Well, the strange thing is, <clears throat> I'm not saying you become detached, but you're so concentrated on getting the story, making sure the pictures are right, working out in your head how it's going to fit together, that you're often one step removed. But I remember <clears throat> when Gemma came to me with this story and I read it on paper and I thought, this is something quite significant. And not everyone had said that, even in our building, it had kind of passed me. But I thought, this is different, this is different. And kind of said to Gemma, I really believe in you. And that story went round the world. We got a big hit on BBC News Online because I think we had a discussion. Where should we take this story? And we it, News Online, so this was 2010, it was kind of pretty established. We took it there and just, it was massive. And I remember being rung up by the Guardian newspaper saying, why didn't you give this story to us as an exclusive? We would have given you a full page on this story. It's so good. And I remember saying to Gemma, yeah, but we gave it to News Online and everybody got it. So it's got to be better for them, you know, the, the, the programme. Absolutely. And that, that story I remember very vividly. It's a long time ago. It's 13 years ago, I suppose. But I remember you coming to me with that story and me, I kind of always knew this series was going to work, I think, in my bones. Yeah. But like yeah. I say, people at the channel were quite worried about it. And I remember being able to report back, we've got this story and there was a palpable sigh of relief because everyone could see, oh, thank the Lord, it's not just going to be archaeologists grubbing around in a, in a dark trench and, and putting up a, a little piece of a, a beaker or something like that. What I really liked about the Hamilton kind of, uh, you know, 97 babies was that it was a great detective story because the archaeologist had found the bones in 1912. Just he was very meticulous about where he found them, giving depths and positions, but he'd still bundled them away in these cigar boxes and stuff, labelled them, properly labelled them, and then written one short paragraph about oh, yes, we found this, this, this. He's more interested in brooches and things like that. But that wasn't, for me, my favourite story. My favourite story was the one which, funnily enough, featured in the opening episode of the latest series, Series 10, which was Miles Davis down at Beer Regis, I think it was, in Dorset, where he'd been... I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is why it's a bit crazy in the programme about Romans, it was actually an Iron Age settlement. So in some ways I was thinking, hang on, should I have got that story? Should it have gone to the Iron Age programme? But actually the reason they did it was because the Romans influence on that Iron Age settlement and then the Romans coming afterwards and what they did. But what was quite extraordinary about Miles was his turn of phrase. He put, he painted this picture of the influence of the Romans on this Iron Age um, uh, settlement and he, he for example you know put pulled out of his pocket these chicken bones and said look they're eating chickens chickens were never even introduced into uh iron age britain until the romans came but they were eating them before so it showed there was this trade with rome and he had these jars of amphora which he said would have carried wine and he said they were drinking uh you know roman wine or wine from Spain, which was in the Roman Empire at the time. But the best thing, which again, they picked up on, I think in, in the last series, was this Iron Age man who was buried in this kind of big chalk hole. And he was face down on a bed of meat and a horse's jaw. And it was actually gobsmacking, gobsmacking. And what, what if anything, could they postulate about this or did they just say we don't well, know? forgive me I, I i i did i wrote down something which he said which as i said why i like miles was that um he had a, a great turn of phrase and he described it because the post these these holes were right in the middle of the settlement he said it's the equivalent of burying an aunt and uncle an aunt or an uncle in a cupboard in the kitchen <laughs> and i just i love that idea i mean 
it was kind of some sort of, I, I mean, who am I to kind of guess why they did it? But quite extraordinary in their midst to bury someone like this. It, it, it? It's what archaeology gives you, isn't it? It's kind of like um, keyhole surgery back into the past. You come across these extraordinary things. And sometimes, you know, this is 2,000 years old. Sometimes you, you, you're going back 10, 20, 50, 100,000 years. And you're finding these, these, a lot of the time, what strikes us, I think, is, a, is about burials. And it is about how people in the past have always buried their loved ones when they buried them with love. And it's extraordinary that with love or with ritual or with um, ceremony, it's extraordinary that that kind of persists to this day. Um, and it was... I mean, they, they weren't the only, they weren't the only burials. We'd, we went to what was we called the Kent Road Scheme, which was on the Isle of Thanet, right? kind of far end of Kent and they were building this new uh, dual carriageway six miles I think it was and um, and it was Wessex and Oxford archaeology who were kind of like the biggest players in the country and they had 130 archaeologists working on it plus another 20 or 30 back in the huts or so cleaning up the stuff so it's a massive massive dig and again being chalk they had these graveyards of uh, well it, it was pre-christian ones they could tell because they were facing north south with goods and then there were christian ones and these were saxons um who were then facing east west with no goods as such um and right next to us was this busy a road people whizzing past whizzing past and you just think right next to you are all these bodies you know, at least 1,000, uh, 1,500 years old, just buried, lying there with grave goods. And there's, it was only the building of this road that kind of brought them out. There's, there's one thing I miss about the the, uh, the new series, and it was the opening line. And it was actually the opening line of how we pitched this to, to the BBC. And it, it's absolutely encapsulating what you just said. We may be a small country, but we've got a big history. Everywhere you walk, there are worlds beneath your feet. And, and it was... That was what we were trying to do, was open up those worlds. There's one last story I'd like to talk to you about, John. It's the, the coin hoard. Tell us yes. about the coin hoard. Well, this, this came up, again, quite late in the day. And this detectorist, and you have to remember, this was all before, you know, the drama detectorists and metal detectors. And then they were a bit of a dirty word in some ways. But this... Fact, hold on, let me just interrupt you and explain why they were a dirty word for archaeologists. Well, the, there's an expression about night hawks, people who raid kind of archaeology sites looking for goodies. And it's very, very difficult. And there's been a bit of a clash with archaeologists and, uh, and people who kind of want the goodies themselves. But there are, are a group of people who, you know, as in the trauma, they're called detectorists, who actually do metal detecting for a hobby. And this one guy called Dave Crisp, had done everything, got permission in this field in Somerset, and we had to make sure that no one knows where it is. I couldn't even tell you where it was now. If you said, oh, take me to the field, I don't know. I don't have no idea. It was kind of kept pretty secret. And Alice went and met him, and he went through uh, He went through the kind of process. And I remember talking to my um, uh, film editor, John Wilkinson, who's a wonderfully talented person who put this together, and he said... Oh, I remember a phrase that Dave Crisp used. He said, he said, it was a bit of a bit of an iffy signal. It was a bit of an iffy signal. And then he went through the process of how they found these thousands of thousands and thousands of Roman coins. It was the biggest hoard that had ever been found in Britain. I don't know whether it's been superseded since, but at the time it was really, really big. And the absolute key thing to it in terms of the archaeologists, is that Dave had reported the find to the Portable Antiquities Scheme, who worked with the British Museum, and they sent out an archaeologist who uncovered it, along with Dave, and, and then we went to the British Museum and they went through it and they kind of discovered that it's probably worth about £100,000 in today's money, um, but it put the portable antiquities scheme very much in the forefront and in the detectorists 
that went out at Christmas, they're dealing with the portable antiquities scheme. And there seems to have been a kind of meeting of archaeologists and detectorists. Well, John, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for letting us in. Uh, both John and I are uh, members of the Content Club, founding the Content Club. And what we're trying to do at the Content Club is we're trying to open up the world of television production. We're trying to uh, assemble fans of history and archaeology, expert historians and archaeologists and TV producers, and actually make TV in a more collaborative, open way. We hope you'll join us. Thanks very much.